Um, so hopefully you'll pardon... Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here so early. Um, hopefully you'll pardon any hiccups in the next 20 minutes. I was kind of queued up to do a Q&A and trimmed my slides down to like the barest, scarcest minimum resource I could find um, so that it would be a compelling conversation. And, and now I'm going to do this on my own, um, which is unfortunate because Catherine's a really great partner on this. Um, but we'll see where this takes us. Um, so my name's Loic, um, Loic Talon. I'm a Chief Digital Officer at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, and my topic is the future of museums. And implicitly by the fact that it's the Chief Digital Officer sitting here, I'm going to suggest the future is digital. Um, I think there are a number of really important topics also in the museum's future, around funding, around restitution of artworks, which are also really cool topics, um, which I'm not going to talk about. So we're, we're going to look at one narrow kind of thread of what the future looks like, focused specifically on digital. So that's the Met. Um, can I just ask, who is, who's been there? Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for going. Um, it's like the number one rated museum now on TripAdvisor, which we're really proud of. It's like the best KPI I can think of for someone like rating how good an experience is. Um, it's a truly epic place to give you a sense of a museum was founded in, in 1870. Um, so we're almost 150 years old. Next year will be 150. Um, we get about 7.3 million visitors every single year. Um, our operating budget is about $317 million, so it's a significant sum. Um, and we're about 2,000 uh, members of staff inside that museum. So 2,000. I run a digital department of around 60 people. I think it's really important to kind of give that scale right at the outset, because in this beautiful museum I was walking around earlier, they probably don't benefit from any of the same factors of scale that we do at the Met. So any kind of suggestion of what the history would look like at the Met for museums. It's probably a little bit different from other museums. That being said, I do think there are certain common principles that apply. It was actually really interesting hearing the last session talking about open data and talking about AI, and some of those principles that start connecting industries, which we're now thinking about at the Met. So there's a museum. Um, one of the things that I always say you have to start for with any, any job is like, what are you trying to do? And what's awesome at the Met is we have this fantastic mission statement. Um, so I, I'm going to read it, because I love this thing. Um, so the Metropolitan Museum of Art collects, studies, conserves, and presents sig significant works of art across all cultures and periods in order to connect people to knowledge, creativity, and ideas. In order to connect people to knowledge, creativity, and ideas. The highlighting is mine. Um, it's a truly awesome statement. To get to go to work every day and try and do that the best way possible is a fun thing to wake up for. Um, the things that excite me and things to remember over the next 15 minutes is one is this idea of across all times and cultures. So we're a museum that covers 5,000 years of human history. We, our aim is to, kind of ha to, to be encyclopedic, to be one of the great encyclopedic museums in the world, 1.5 million artworks. And then you get to this second part, to connect people to creativity, knowledge, and ideas. Now, I love looking at this statement um, with this little background in the, of the building. And you know, museums were founded in the 19th century. Most, you know, most big museums are kind of a 19th century institution. And um, when I'm feeling more and more like a troublemaker inside a museum, I'll be sitting with my director and my, and my president, both of whom are fantastic and tolerate me admirably. Um, they will, I'll look at this statement and I'll say, you know, when we read this, nowhere does it say it's a building. Okay, if you actually, if you gave someone, actually, bet, if you gave someone that mission statement today, they probably wouldn't build a building, not one which is publicly viewable. Someone would probably start some kind of digital presence of some sort, um, maybe a website, and start creating, like, collecting content. And someone may tell me then, oh, but wait, they say you're going to collect artworks. If you collect artworks, you've got to put them somewhere. It's like, yeah, well, okay, well, we'll find a cheaper place to put things. But I think you can connect people to creativity, knowledge, and ideas through art in a way that doesn't imply you have to come to a building. So I want to start this from a premise when I think of the future of museums or the future of kind of knowledge spaces. There is the building component, and I think there will always be this experience at a museum. But if we're talking about scaling, getting past the seven, getting beyond the 7.3 million people that have the privilege of coming to New York each year, I want to start thinking about the 3.9 billion people that have an internet connection. How can I reach those people? How can I start defining the museum relationship to that audience? So, that's the premise I'm going to push along. It's really important to note that I don't think one replaces the other. I've never heard someone say, oh, but digital is the substitute for the physical experience. I think museums have an incredible role as this kind of trusted source of information. 
which is even more vital today in a world of fake news and the likes. Um, museums are one of these trusted institutions, so I think the physical presence is important. But I want to take this on, take a, push a little bit on what it might mean in the digital space when you start thinking of scaling our audience. So one of the premises we use in, in, uh, at the Met is this idea that we have this really fantastic collection. I put up a few artworks here that, I mean, even to call that an artwork is just a privilege. Um, we kind of run by this principle that we probably have one artwork in the museum, one artwork among our 1.5 million artworks that can inspire every single person in the world. I really actually believe that. I don't think there's a single person in the world that could not find something in the Met that would inspire them. So my audience, I define it as 3.9 billion because someone else is going to solve the internet connectivity issues. That's my audience right now. It's going to keep growing. So basically, I've got to find to remove every single barrier between a person who would be inspired by a work of art in a Met collection and the object itself. Now, of course, some of those barriers are, in fact, the word museum. It still makes me smile. I mean, I'm an art historian by training. But lots of people say, oh, no, museums just aren't really for me. I don't even like art. I love Instagram. I love Instagram. Um, but I don't love art. Um, so you've actually got some certain psychological barriers to get over. We need to get over the fact that actually at the Met, our, pr our predominant mode of communication has been the English language for a long time. Of course, not everyone speaks English. So one of the things we've been thinking, if we want to start saying that our audience is 3.9 billion people, what are, the, what are the big levers that we have to pull in order to scale our audience? And we've come down onto, onto four factors that we're really looking at. One is how we license our content. Um, we really are moving pretty assertively now into the, into the, the open data space. Um, about, it was about two years ago now, we made the decision to take all of our data, all, all data relating to public domain works in the collection, and release it into the commons. So everything has a CC0 license. You can now download an image from the Met, use it, reuse it however you wish. So licensing is an important one. Languages is a second important tool we're now using. How can we get our content out into a multilingual environment? A third is building APIs, so really getting our content and being able to connect to other people, to connect to other systems on scale. And a fourth is how we build partnerships. So I'm going to go through two of those, particularly around the open data and particularly around the APIs, which will be two great questions Catherine was going to ask me, um, and tell you how those really impact us the most. Um, so that's the license. So it was in, in February 2017, we made a decision that one of the best ways of scaling was to remove some of the restrictions to our content and allow people to use and reuse our data and our images in the simplest way possible. That icon, to me, is hugely important. To let you know what it means to the user, um, let me take you on what that journey looks like. So this is a Degas work in our collection, which, whoop, there we go, um, the dance class. Um, so what it means now, that anyone going to our website, so we get about 30, 32 million people coming to our website each year. They can now go to our website. They can go and find that image. Um, they will see it's in the public domain, so we indicate it. So that means that image and the data is available for people to use in whatever way they, they see fit, without restriction. They can choose to download that image, and we've made available the highest resolution version of that image we possibly can. So you can download it. Um, and I love doing this because it always makes me smile. But you can start zooming into the image and start seeing details in that image which maybe you hadn't seen before. And this is something we're letting anyone be able to do now. You can get this image for free. You can go on the website now and download it. And of course, when you tell someone they can do that, and then you remove the rules around, around how they can use the image, we found we've had lots of artists, lots of creators and makers start using the collection in ways we weren't anticipating. Now, as an art historian, I love the narrative um, that every artist builds on the work of the people before them. I feel like we've just created a whole palette of content now that artists have started taking. And to give you one of my favorite examples, we had this wonderful artist called Simone Segal, who took two of our works, um, one by Kandinsky and one by Odi Toko, um, and thought, what would have happened if these works could have moved? Um, and so she created her own GIF version of a moving Kandinsky and a moving Japanese print. Um, and there are thousands of these now out there, ways that people have used the Met Collection to inspire a new form of creativity. And I'm not really here to comment on which ones I think are good, which ones I think are bad. But the fact that we're actually prompting this kind of creativity, I do think is awesome. And it's a new way of getting people to connect with knowledge, creativity, and ideas that the collection is opening up. So that's kind of one thread, the whole use of the artwork, the download of the artwork. Um, a second thread which 
I deleted the slides for, but I do think it's really important to, to, to talk about, especially in the context of the last session, is that all the data about the artwork now, we've actually, so we have created an API to the Met collection. We have about, we have 1.5 million artworks. We have a whole team who all they are doing is digitizing the collection. So we digitize about 20,000 works every single year. So we literally are taking works out, photographing, adding metadata, putting the work back away. And that metadata now, when you have 440,000 works spanning human history, is an incredible pool to be able to start analyzing. So by having an API, we've actually started partnering with, with different organizations, most recently with MIT and with Microsoft, looking at what would happen if you start passing AI over this data in huge quantities. What are the new facts, what are the new points you can ex withdraw, extract from this 5,000 years of human history? Even down to when you start passing image recognition software over a collection on scale, can we start finding new trends in human history, which maybe we weren't aware of? So getting this relationship now between humans and people to go over the data is a big one to us. Um, and I can tell you that when we, so our anniversary of open access, second year anniversary is in February, so in about two weeks time, February 2019. And at that event, we'll be releasing a, kind of a whole set of projects we've been doing with those two partners, really looking at what is the value, how can AI change how we are interacting with art. And I think there's something about working on scale that I find really fascinating. So the last component, so I think we've got the use of the images and reuse of images. The second part is around people using the data. A third really interesting angle, which I find is having maybe the largest impact at the Met, is moving people away from the idea that you have to come to the Met's website to find, a, find an object from a collection. I mentioned a little bit earlier that most people don't think museums are for them, or maybe they don't think art is for them. So I don't want that to be a barrier. I would like the artwork, the beautiful objects of human history that we have to be the first things that people encounter. And to do that, I can't tell them you have to come to metmuseum.org to find it. I can't tell them it, 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 it breaks my heart. But most people in the world do not know the Met exists rather know that it does. I'm really delighted to be in such an audience that do, do know we exist, but that is a reality. So I want to try and overcome those barriers. So how are we thinking about that? Well, when we went open access, when we decided that images were free, we started talking with other large platforms, other large organizations, about where, how they could start hosting the collection, how they can start putting the collection in contexts and environments that maybe we couldn't reach ourselves. And one of our greatest partnerships has actually been with the Wikimedia community, and is what Catherine and I have been working on. And I tend to kind of gag at graphs, charts, when I put them on screen, but I, Catherine and I decided this one was one we were going to do. Um, this just gives you a rough sense of, um, and just look at it as a line that's not really going anywhere. Um, this is traffic to a museum's website um, on an annual basis, comparing one year to the next. We had this nice like, incremental growth thing happening between 2016 and 2017. Um, what always entertains me when I look at this graph is you can see the school year in the graph. You know, when the students are out, our website gets less traffic. Um, that's, that's life, I guess. Um, but by scaling, by deciding we're actually going to change the KPIs around from saying, rather than saying uh, success is getting people to our website, and say success is connecting people to knowledge, creativity, and ideas. It's not getting people to our website. So we can connect people to knowledge, creativity, and ideas on other people's platforms. It's actually cheaper for us to do on other people's platforms than our own, and we reach larger audiences. And in partnering with Wikipedia, from starting in 2016, we started putting our, our, um, our collection onto Wikipedia. And we went from about having 2 million people a month experiencing the Met collection on Wikipedia to about 10 million in a year, and we're now somewhere around 18 million people a year experiencing the collection on Wikipedia. And what's nice is because most people, in fact, when they're looking for information, when they start Googling something, it's hunting for something, Wikipedia is one of the top sites that comes out. And so by putting our collection up there, you're making it available in contexts and in languages that are very different from what the Met can do itself. And I've got two really interesting examples we use to illustrate that at the museum. The first is this one. So this is Death of Socrates, and this fantastic um, painting by David that we have. And on our website, we're presenting it in one language. When the Wikimedia community took that content, took it as open data and populated it onto Wikipedia, they translated that page into 29 different languages. But we can't do that. Like, the cost of translating that content is too high for us. But being able to say, hey, the community wants to use the content and present it like that is a really important step. So we're scaling from one language group to 29 language groups. Another fascinating one for me is this one of Henry VIII. So, we have this beautiful, actually, we have three wonderful um, armors of Henry VIII. This is actually probably my favorite one, because he's actually quite large in it, and there's kind of no chance he wore this. Um, 
So the Henry VIII, the Henry VIII armor page on the Met's website gets 180 people a month. I mean, you could probably clip them in yourself. On the Wikipedia page, where we're also now talking about this armor, they get 405,000 users per month. So it's three orders of magnitude that we are getting by putting our content onto Wikipedia. And within that, for us, in terms of connecting people to knowledge, creativity, and ideas, I'll keep coming back to that statement because it's our mission statement. There are more people interested about Hemi V8 than Hemi V8's armor. Like just as a Google thing, more people are going to have a Hemi V8's path than the Hemi V8's armor path. So if we can get the Met collection and all of our objects, honestly, from the way that we see it through this art lens and say, hey, you have to approach this from art, and instead approach it from a sense of human history, we'll be able to connect people on a larger scale. So when I start thinking about this idea of museum, the museum of the future, and you start thinking of open data, you start thinking about how people can use and reuse your collection um, through an API, and then also publishing content out, we're really moving to this idea, if I was to say one particular push, and did I actually delete this slide or not? I did, I did delete the, in, the interstitial slide. I think we're really moving towards this idea now that a museum is, is one thing, it's a building, but it's also a platform. I think this, this concept of museum as platform is something we're going to see more and more. And the idea being that it's a platform that people can start reusing and connecting themselves to in order to link to 5,000 years of human history. We even take the example here. You have this amazing collection of bicycles, from bicycles from 1817. If you haven't looked at them, there are some beautiful ones. This number four down there like, has this, it's one of the very first bicycles with a bike chain, which is a human invention. There are more people in the world interested in that bicycle than the number of people that are going to come into this building. Like, that is a given, and we need to treat the challenge that way. And that's why I think if you, if you look at it as a museum, as a platform, it's something for people to build upon with their creativity, their ideas. That is a scalable solution for the future. And it allows us to then look at this mission, the original mission of the museum, and say, that's how we're going to interpret it for the digital age. So that's what we're doing at the Met. Um, there would have been a lot more Q&A in that sense. But I'm just going to put the emphasis on you guys. I have like three minutes left. If anyone has any questions about things I've said, or I'll start here. Thank you. Um, OK. We are Go. in a place that the creator, it's very important. Uh, do you envision a copyright-free future, especially in the field of arts? Um, we are talking about totally. open data, open source. Yep. How do you envision the future? So I envision, it's a really good question, asked by an artist as well. I, guess I'm, like, yes. so I can see that perspective. So there's one a really important distinction that, um, that I didn't emphasize in this, but I'm going to emphasize now because it is super important, is what the Met is doing is we're taking works that are defined as public domain. So the artist is dead for more than 70 years, or the work itself is unknown, is unknown artist, and the work existed for more than 110 years. Those are the two facts that exist. So when Andy Warhol doesn't fulfill those criteria, it's not being released as open data. So copyright law of, uh, of uh, like the... the um, Public domain rules, the uh, laws that go across kind of globally, that 70 years and 110 years are two factors that exist and which we are kind of utilizing to actually say we want to use public domain, domain rules as our benchmark of releasing content. So nothing in our contemporary collection goes out under open access. It's only things that are defined as public domain by law. I think it's worth a conversation. Um, I do think that if you look at copyright law, the reason it was created was uh, bits of it are questionable. And I do, I do think it's worth us having a conversation about what copyright laws should be. And certainly when I work with artists myself, I encourage them to have a very open view about it. I do think there has been, and even at a the museum, there's been a period where we got very instinctively put C in a circle on all of our content. I'll take, for example, one of our, our major pieces. Um, are these essays we write about our artworks, and we, we, we got in the habit of putting C in a circle, so all copyright restricted for that content. But I do argue there are other Creative Commons licenses, if we know the Creative Commons suite of licenses, there are other licenses we could be using, such as no commercial use, CC no commercial use, um, or CC must have attributes. There are other licenses which would be completely appropriate to our content and actually help us serve that mission. So I do think, whilst I'm not going to advocate straight here to say it has to change, I do think a more sophisticated conversation is needed around it. Someone else has a time keep for me. I imagine someone will wave to me when I to get off. <coughs> Look, what, is, what has been the reaction to the organization inside the Met to, oh, to that great question. movement? And what, are there any ripple effects across other museums? The, I think the ripple effect, you know, museums are, I love museums, I'm not a historian, but I think we'll all say museums, museums are not pioneers of change. Um, that's not, I mean, people like, 
it's not what muse uh, mu change is not necessarily in museums' DNA. Um, so I do think any big change, and this was a significant one, does create ripple effects. It's caused us to have lots of conversations about what do we think is the appropriate way of looking at art. And it, I think where we reached on that is that since museums started in the 19th century, we created all these kind of rules that had to be followed to look at art. And we do question how many of those rules we should be the rule keeper of, and how many it should be actually our responsibility is to protect and maintain the object, to study it, to conserve it, to make sure it exists in perpetuity. And that's really the first part of our goal. We will do that to, in the most professional way possible to make sure this object will always exist. But then there becomes a point where we have to put it into the, into, the, into the global trust, per se, and say it's for other people to use it. And I mean, one of our big conversations were, you know, Technically, with this policy, someone could choose to start putting the Met artworks on pasta packets or shower curtains um, anywhere in the world, and, and we're allowing them to do it. And so you always have these examples which kind of test, test our principles of what's allowed or what we should allow possible and what's, what's not. But I'll always make the point, when I think of, um, I'll use the example of the Louvre, one of my typical cases, like no one goes to the Louvre, arrives in front of Mona Lisa and goes, oh, that's what it looks like, huh? Like, everyone's seen this thing. Everyone knows what it looks like, but there's still that moment of saying, when you're in front of a physical object, like, there's that, that connection you have to it. And if I was to try and find the KPI, the measure of success I'm really looking for for the Met, if I project far into the future, it's the idea that, you know, there, is, there are still far too many tourists that come to New York and don't come to the Met. And it's because not everyone necessarily knows what's inside the Met, apart from 5,000 years of human history, which is a huge concept. Everyone knows what's inside the Louvre, and their, their tourist penetration is huge. So if I was to say, like, what my ultimate KPI, if we get the artworks out there, get more people engaged them, when people come to New York, which a lot of people do once in their life, they'll say, oh, I'm not going to dare miss the Met. And that's where you want to get to. As you're yeah. digitizing your artworks, yep. you're generating huge amounts of data, I assume <laughs> other, mm -hmm. other uh, museums do the same. Are you already running into integrity problems? Are you oh, already finding out that some of the artworks may have m been misattributed or totally. frankly are fakes? Yeah, it's... I think your question merits more than me just saying yes. Um, the data issue is huge. I mean, so we have 220 terabytes of data now that we've collecting on a mass. Um, like any attribution system, any data system, humans were involved in it which means it's, 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 it's not infallible. So yeah, we do come up with data, data consistency issues. Um, you know, all we can do is just publish everything, honestly, and just say if someone sees something they think is incorrect, we look into it. So we have a pretty good reactive policy. Taking it proactively, I think, is very challenging. What's fun, though, um, and where I do start thinking about things with, uh, like where AI could start becoming super interesting to us, is when it can process the whole data set and look for inconsistencies and pass those inconsistencies to a human being to then research. That relationship is one that I am really excited by. And um, I think that's where AI starts becoming very interesting when it becomes a human AI, human machine relationship rather than just rely on the machine. I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>